The biggest misconception is that dance music is a new thing, that it just kind of burst from the ether. People don't see it as part of a long history. My drive has always been about sharing the love of music, finding it and then sharing it. Some tracks make me really happy. Some tracks make me think. Some tracks make you forget everything. Such an experience of freedom and experiencing this freedom with other people, all through the sound of music. Dance music has always been about an escape and a letting go. Just get lost in, in this aural soundscape. Close my eyes, stick my head in the speaker, and just be absorbed. I've always done everything for the love of music. Always. I was always building tree houses with my dad. And we put a radio in it, bought like cheap car speakers, kept expanding it. Before we knew it, we had like a kind of tree, tree house club. <laughs> my friends were there, we started playing music. Then, we made it like mobile so we could like travel with it. It wasn't a tree house anymore, it was just like a kind of DJ booth. We made a very big sign saying DJ Marty on it. And it all fitted in the car so I could drive into uh, and the places where he wanted to perform. I was eight years old. My father was bringing the music home. I got inspired by the music he was playing. Carl played music non-stop. We constantly told him Turn it down, turn it down. I used to take my sound system to school and an hour break that we had, I would play music to the, to the canteen. I kind of grew up all the way through the 70s, 80s, playing hip hop, R&B, funk and soul music. Most of the parties that I did, we never got paid for. My dad thought I would amount to nothing. DJing was not something that my dad thought was a job. He didn't encourage Carl. He was always just looking at me going, just get a proper job because whatever you're doing now is never going to amount to anything. I discovered electronic music due to Chesto's performing at the Olympics. I heard like the sound on television and I never, never kind of listened to it before. I never really got connected to it. I, I loved it. I, I played at like the local house parties for like 10 people. I had my first real DJ gig in 16th of January, 2010. There were like 250 people and that was for me already like, that was like a goal for me to like make it bigger. I started to understand music at a very early age. I just studied it as much as I possibly could. Where does it all stem from? How did we get here? Well, 
When I first started working in nightclubs, there were really one kind of music that would fill a room, live music. The people I worked for had a concept where they would have a DJ play records. Everybody said, it'll never work. People want to see a live band. That was sort of the beginning of disco. Uh, everyone comes here to do whatever they want. This goes the phenomenon of our time. The Paradise Garage. where so many artists, so many people met and congregated and, and created the downtown New York scene. It was a way for people who were disenfranchised to connect with other like-minded individuals, express themselves, and dance. That was kind of the the theater for the DJ, the way Larry LeVan was playing. He had two copies of the same record, going between the two turntables, remixing the record on the fly and extending bits that worked with the crowd. You know, he knew about sound, how to pick the right music at the right time, and it just opened up a whole new thing for everybody. It's just DJ heaven you know, when you walked in that club. It's a space for an idea, for freedom and expression that was outside of popular culture. And then the next thing I knew, every single Holiday Inn in America converted their lounge into a discotheque and it started becoming a caricature of itself. It became almost too comical. Disco died an ugly death. Disco sucks! Disco sucks! Disco sucks! It was billed as Disco Demolition Night, and the White Sox went along. In Chicago, Shock Jock on the radio challenged everyone to burn their disco records. And everyone did it. One of the saddest sights I've ever seen in a ballpark in my life. It's getting out of hand. America just gave up on disco and kind of came out of its stupor and said, this is gay black music. We, we can't listen to this. We like rock and roll. So then it went back underground. Those primal beats returned in different forms. Really like a rebirth of disco. Although it, it wasn't called disco. House music first kind of started, it was like the map was completely redrawn. The inner city of Chicago really celebrating disco from 10 years before. Experimental sessions of, of, of setting drum machines and synthesizers. And no one had ever actually heard what a drum pattern played over six, seven minutes coming out of a machine sounded like. The beginning for me for this movement was basically Chippy Chanter Jack, 1986. This track for me changed everything. It would literally stop the dance floor. People didn't understand where this was coming from. Why am I playing it? It has no elements or soul to it because they can't see a band. Well, to me, that was exciting because all we've done is see bands. Now what we're seeing is, is, is what can be created electronically.
disco music was made by musicians, arrangers, songwriters. When house music started being made, it was made by DJs. We had no musical training. I was lucky to stumble upon the Detroit scene very early. I was probably 16, 17. The main hub was a, a club called the Music Institute. A black box, big speakers and a strobe light. All the Detroit guys playing incredible music. Jeff Mills, he was like playing so fast. He was playing all the records that I had listened to for the last year. And we were sitting in the back helping him sort his records and just copying all the records' names down. Listening to those first records, it was like every time it was like not only listening to the future, but even if it wasn't every day or every week, there was always something just when you started to get a little bit comfortable, someone else released a new record. The sound is minimal. If it was direct and in your face, more industrial. Detroit is a motor city. The Ford Motor production line. That's what you hear when you hear Kevin Saunderson and Derek May and Juan Atkins, their early records. They're stark, but they're these sounds and synthesizers and these like hi-hats, and it's just like, like pulling you into tomorrow. People like that feel good and in tune with technology, not afraid of it. And they're like, ah, where is this going to take us? A lot of the artists, they were enjoying a moment of creativity. And I found a lot of music that was being made in America wasn't being played in America. I just kept buying these records whether they made from Chicago, Detroit. Every record that I bought was an American import and I was buying it and playing it in the UK. The birth of house music and then the birth of the Detroit sound did have a profound effect on what we were playing as DJs in the UK. It wasn't really fashionable to be a DJ. You could identify yourself by playing music that you and your friends love that kind of wasn't on the radio. Trevor Fung, he was a big DJ in Britain as I was growing up. I got to meet him, to hang out with him, and, and really got uh, excited by what he introduced me to. The British interpretation of what America was doing. For the likes of me and Paul Oakenfold, we were more excited about change than we were about staying in our own lane. We were obsessed about innovation, hunting for music. Trevor, he was in Ibiza working there all summer. I went there with a few friends. We went to this club called Amnesia. All that excitement, we could run all night into the morning and, and just going out and going crazy.
Ibiza is a, a seasonal place. The end of May, early June, until September. Me and Trevor went on to start our own club. It was such a wonderful, exciting moment. We were very free in the respect of what we played. So you would hear Cindy Lauper next to LL Cool J, next to Bob Marley, next to a, a, a house record. We didn't do clubs at the weekend. The clubs that I run were on Monday and Thursday night till 3.30 in the morning. If it meant that you would stay up all night and go to work, then so be it. We were underground. It wasn't a commercial movement. We were in the moment, really living this scene. Cole Cox was my, my sound man at the time. When I started, yeah, I was going up and down the country in the UK, playing four or five gigs every weekend. It was only until around about 27, 28 that people started knowing and started hearing the name Carl Cox. The longest set I've ever played is up to about 10 hours. Most people only go to work for eight hours a day. In the eight hours, they have, you know, a breakfast, they have a tea break, they have a lunch break, they have another tea break, and they go home for tea. We're still playing. <laughs> I played the guitar at the time. Had so many ideas which I had on a guitar, but I had no nothing to like put it in. Started messing around with the ideas and with the melodies which I created on my guitar. I started doing some research and I found like this program which allowed me to put my guitar melodies in the computer. I finished my first record when I was like 10 or something. I still have it. It's, it's, it's completely terrible, but I was super proud of it. I was doing everything from my bedroom. Luckily, I had a neighbor who was deaf, who wasn't complaining about my noise. I had agreements with my parents that after 10 p.m. I couldn't play loud music anymore because my sister wanted to go to sleep. Then I would be at the middle of the night with my headphones on. I got discovered through a local DJ and I made an unofficial remix for Tonight by Enrique Iglesias and he started playing it out live at his shows. Some other DJs contacted me and one of them was looking for a producer and I played him some of my stuff and he was like, one track, oh I really like the track and and he released it on Spinning Records. And the track became really big. Spinning Records, they, they invited me at their office and it was fun, I never told them how old I was until I actually met them in real life and they were like, fuck off, this, this, this can't be true. So then they joined me to my house, to my room where I still produce the music and they were like, yeah, show, it, show what you do. And I, I showed them like a lot of new stuff 
a lot of melodies which I was working on and not that much later I signed on Spin Records. In the early days, the DJ was someone that could juggle two or three or four turntables. You had to really be talented to be a DJ that can play continuous music. The craft was always about mixing music from a perspective, always about digging into the crate, always about playing new music to people so they can actually expect the unexpected. You can give another DJ the same records and have us play in front of a crowd. Those records will sound different when we eat, we each play them. It's getting creative with what, what you have. I think that's something that can't be taught. It's something that comes from here. With computers now, you know, you have a lot of people who don't know how to mix, don't know how to DJ. They've never done it, it's, it's because technology they came in when this technology was available and that's all they used and they go, you know what, I can do this live. There are a lot of DJs who've got pre-programmed sets and unfortunately I just press and play. Right now there's a lot of USB DJs, which I'm part of. But you are also DJing, but just in a different way. If you play USB and you don't use vinyls anymore, does that make you not a real DJ? That's exactly the same thing. You use the technology that is available to you today. No, I don't get it. It's a laptop and a dude. And that's it. People want DJs to play the records they love. Buy the, the top 20 records, put them on a USB stick, put your hands in the air, you have a big smile on your face, and away you go. If you got your hands in the air for three quarters of your show, how are you mixing records? If you're throwing pies at people, how are you mixing records? This is kind of dumbing down of what, what made the craft the craft. Watching some of the guys that do the main stages at festivals play their hour-long pre-recorded set with their arms in the air, it's very hard to equate that to what, say, Carl Cox does in our set at Space. The 80s were not really a, a great years for the UK. We had a series of, you know, industrial strikes, people with no jobs, violence and riots. At the same time, clubbing was very exclusive. That changed in the kind of mid to late 80s. Lasers, smoke machines, smiley faces, the sound of acid house music had arrived and I was like, what is this?
before you know it, that sound had kind of taken over. Rave culture developed from acid house, outdoor parties held in fields. Something completely new that no one had ever done before. There's no legal venue in London you could do that, hence starting to do it in warehouses and fields around the M25. The only way we had to know where these parties were happening was if you had a number to call. The address would be on the answer phone. You are cordially invited to a Midsummer's Night's Dream. Take the M25 motorway to 8296. It was called the Summer of Love because the culture finds its, its roots in the hippie culture, the late 60s, and peace and love. In the world of electronic dance music, we are in sort of uncharted territory. When I was growing up, dance music was supposed to be the alternative. You know, you're supposed to have top 40 over here and dance music over here, and dance music was supposed to be the domain of like weird underground misfit electronic musicians. Underground dance music is about art, where EDM, is show business. And there is still some of the same shared aesthetics of unity and expression and people opening up, you know, but there are two different things. The main core of our music will always be underground. Doesn't matter if you're Carl Cox or Tiesto or, or Martin Garrix, it it's always will be underground. With uh, the popularity of electronic music today, sure, um, we all appreciate that more and more kids are into it. Um, but, you know, we always hope that getting into electronic music via like Afrojack or Tiesto, they're just sort of scratching the surface and, and you know, interested to explore further. The thing with dance music, it is not about vocals, but it's around arrangement. The whole journey you can take someone on. You create something that sounds like, hey, this is a nice song, like for people that are not used to dance music, and then you present them with the drum. If I ask my grandma, do you like the drop? She's like, what's the drop? I she hear the drop, look, ooh, I like the dancey part. I like the dancey part. I've got this bad habit when I start working on an idea. I'm like working on working on like a breakdown so much and I build up and then I have to come up with a drop and I'm like, oh. Martin Skypes me and he's like, hey, I have you know, haven't been able to sleep all night. Uh, there's this melody in my head, I made this new record, you need to hear it. And it was the demo of animals. Sometimes I start with a melody, sometimes I start with a kick drum. I go through a sound bank with already pre-programmed sounds, or I start programming my own sound. When we started out, we did very small shows, you know, just to get him going, get, um, get him to experience how uh, the life is and stuff. And, uh, and suddenly, you know, we released his record, Animals. It's an amazing piece of music. That's an example of electronic music becoming top 40 that seems to have quite a lot of integrity around it. This 
special drop, you know. Everybody was making hard drops, but his was still special. This instrumental record becomes a top 40 radio record in the US, a number one single in the UK. He was the first 17 year old guy who made it into the UK chart. He was the youngest guy ever playing Ultra. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. There was this explosion of openness. A lot of the problems of the past just started to fade away. The wall had come down and the world was becoming a more prosperous place. And I feel like the Love Parade was very much a reflection of that, like this new youth culture that wasn't burdened by the prejudices of the past. It started off very innocent. Maybe 250 people. A couple of trucks going through the streets of Berlin and they would just stop the trucks and just pie. East and West come together and brought people who are into dance music to basically celebrate life. The same spirit that went into the illegal raves in, in the UK. You know, it was pretty crazy for the way it grew through through the, the, the first five years of the 90s was insane. The scale of it was just unreal. I can't believe it, it's amazing. I've never seen this many people in one place before. I'm from Holland and I really, really like it here. Why did you start the Love Parade? Because I had a dream of people dancing in the street, nothing else. I was invited to come and uh, be a part of the, of the proceedings. And my first time of going there, it completely blew my mind. Going through the streets of Berlin, I just cannot believe there's over a million and a half people. breaking down the walls, breaking down everything culturally. And there's no way we could have done this anywhere else in the, in the world. We've got this big, massive monument in the middle. And in the monument is where they built the DJ stage. And you go up in the monument, you see over the whole of the, the park. And all you can see is just heads. The craziest thing for me is like how it all went so quick. And that's also why I still don't really realize yet what what's happening right now. Aubrey, is this for Pyro? Yes. I was at Ultra 2013 in the crowd. And right now, uh, you're playing the main stage, you're a main stage actor. And 
it's 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 super. I had to pinch myself a million times. <laughs> It went that fast at every moment. You had no time to get used at the success. It went that fast. But imagine for him, he just did this in two years. Yeah. Well, we did in 10 years, he did in two years. It must be hard to process so much in such a short time, you know? And you go from being in your bedroom to playing in front of 100,000 people in a year almost, like this is crazy. I was in the crowd two years ago. What the fuck? <laughs> like for me it was, boom, this, that, oh, we got a request for tomorrow, and oh, we got, and before you know it, you're, you're in the middle of it, and there's so much happening at the same time that you kind of forget what's happening, and you're focused on the next thing. is a 17-year-old kid the fucking face of dance music. What the fuck? You know? Like... 16, 17-year-old kid makes a record. He's never, he has got no experience ever of playing in front of a crowd. And they book him. Why? So what is Underground? I guess Underground for me uh, is anything that's outside of the, the mainstream outside of like whatever's considered popular, but it's always been more interesting to me. Underground dance music is a representation of trying to do things with a cultural acknowledgement of who we are as humans. There's always gonna be super underground music and there's always gonna be stuff that some people consider cheesy and that's gonna appeal to the pop market. David Guetta's underground to Katy Perry fans. I'm underground for David Guetta fans. Like, compared to me, that mouse is underground. Compared to that mouse, Feed Me would be underground. Compared to Feed Me, Richie Halton would be underground. But if you compare Richie Halton to Nicolas Jarre, Richie Halton is commercial techno. But like, no matter how underground you are, if you're driving your car and AHA, Take On Me comes on the radio, you sing along. If Richie Halton would play it in a set, you would not be happy. But if the song comes on in the car, like, Take on me, take on me. Like, it's always. You, you, can, you can't deny that. And that's why I love music so much, because it's universal. As a DJ, it's incredible because, you know, you could really take them to different heights. I spent time at raves sober, and I've spent time at raves not sober. The sound is huge. Visuals are huge. Everyone's dancing. The crowd is the star. It's hardwired into our evolutionary DNA to want to dance with each other, have ecstatic experiences at night in front of lights. Castle Morton, what began as a small gathering, suddenly turned into this huge, huge rave. At the height of the festival, an estimated 20,000 people had converged on Castle Morton Common. More and more people would arrive, and it went on for a week, and the police just couldn't break it up. It was just so big. 20,000 people on this common and no toilets. You can imagine the mess they're going to leave behind them. 
The police view is that these are purely criminal events. These people are crooks, and they are destroying the lives of hundreds, not to say thousands, of decent, law-abiding citizens. I remember going to some parties that were really dangerous, packed into sweaty warehouses, no lights, no exits. If people get hurt, then it needs to be addressed. It can't, it can't carry on. At that point, a lot of people realized that concept of the illegal raves was, was dead. It couldn't continue. You know, the government were crazy about it, the media were all over it, and so something had to change. You had the beginnings of the legal space where all the DJs could work. launched cream and it just became this phenomenon it just exploded they started putting on really highly produced venues with great sound systems and it was safer i like djing because i was nerdy insecure and djing was the perfect anonymous way to connect and touch hundreds, even thousands of people without actually having to talk to them. You gotta remember in the late 80s, where was the DJ in the club? In the corner, probably the darkest corner. When we set up our club, we put the DJ center stage. We built a huge gold gilt frame around them. So there was no escape in the fact that you had to look in this direction. You had to worship the DJ. We aggressively promoted the concept of the DJ being as important as the lead guitarist or the lead singer in a band. Paul Oakenfold is the most obvious DJ who used the advantage of the time and the interest in DJs and packaged himself as a rock star. I was doing remixes for a lot of the big acts. I was approached by U2 to do some remixes for them. I remixed a track called Even Better Than The Real Thing. That became a bigger hit than the original. And then they asked me if I would like to be the opening act on their world tour. Primarily a rock and roll crowd, so I can't play underground music. So what am I going to do? I didn't want to let anyone down. I started to look at a lot of the remixes that I'd done. I would take classic rock songs and do my own version of it, the club version. They still had the roots and essence of what it was, but it had my flavor to it. 90,000 people, nervous, excited. It was a scary moment walking out and you find just you and, and all these people looking at you. such a wonderful, exciting moment. I really was like, wow, these people are really into it. The big story, you know, wow, there's a DJ playing to a U2 sized crowd. And I think it really kind of set something in motion. That was a big moment for me because it really proved to myself that I was more than just a DJ in a club. I took a lot of what I saw and learned from the biggest band in the world and put into my career. I always wished, like, when I was in my bedroom, like, 
I want to do this in front of 100,000 people, but I never really thought it would happen. I never had the intention to become famous. For me, I, I make music because I love it, because it's my hobby. I do this because I love the music, I have a passion for it. Since I was eight years old, I have not looked back. When the time comes where you have to close the door and put it all behind you, is the time that, that you know that you've done something of self-worth in your life. I believe in what I'm doing. And if you do that, you're gonna find other people that also feel the same. This movement is still pushing forward. Having come to America, and I saw that there was pockets of, of people that were into electronic music in certain cities. Paul turned around to me, literally in the DJ booth, mid-season in Ibiza, and said, by the way, I'm not going to be here next week. Can you do the rest of the season? And I said, why? He said, because I'm going to America, because I'm going to go and break America. I looked at America and thought, I really want the challenge here. I really want to go to Cincinnati. I want to go to Nashville. I want to go to the smaller places. I did uh, about 150 shows in a year. Across the country, backwards and forwards, touring in America in the same way a rock band would. It was like a chemical reaction. This metamorphosis happened with, with the advent of the internet. Napster had started and LimeWire and file sharing really took off. You could make a track at home, you could share it, start sending files around the world. Uh, how many MP3s do you have on your computer? About 600. Maybe like 100. Six or 7,000. Come again? Six or 7,000. All these kids that were really looking for the, for the music and, it, and the internet kind of bought it to them. Suddenly, people were able to monetize themselves in a different way. Big turning point for me was when I sold Hollywood Bowl out. I was like, wow, I didn't realize that there was this many kids that were really into electronic music. Things would just seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger. People started calling from around the world to actually book you for the first time. The DJs started migrating like birds to other parts of the world. Uh, I, I played at festivals and they asked all the people, who do you come here to see? Like most of the people said, we come here to see Tiesto. And the promoter and I decided, why don't we try a Tiesto solo show? You play for like six, seven hours and you might sell out a stadium. Walked on stage and I was like, "This is this is not real." Just one DJ in in a stadium for 25,000 people uh, that that never happened before. There was this one guy from Greece. He saw the concert and he was like, "I want you to play at the Olympics." Uh, DJ Tiesto. Uh... Διάσημος Ολλανδός DJ, ο οποίος αυτή τη μουσική, η οποία για πρώτη φορά δεν είναι εμβατήριο για συνοδεύει τις παρελάσεις των κρατών, αλλά είναι μουσική, δίσκο μουσική. I saw like presidents fist pumping and stuff, so it was it was an amazing experience. It was live on television for 4.6 billion people.
he became the first global superstar. After the Olympics in 2004, you really saw it going further and further into the mainstream. I remember seeing a massive poster that said, sold out Victoria Park. And Victoria Park's like 40,000 people. It said, sold out Victoria Park, Tiesto. I was like, who the fuck's Tiesto? <laughs> we were doing Electric Daisy Carnival. Everything was kind of building up. The crowds kept getting bigger. And in 2002, we did about 6,000 people. And then in 2003, we did about 10,000. Barely trickling up. Y'all ready? Donnie and Pascal, they kind of had to legitimize their business. Like the UK, came away from riskier spaces and, and started to look to reinvent themselves in a dedicated um, legal space. In 2008, Electric Daisy Carnival got 30,000 people. It was an amazing moment. I was like, finally, we're here, you know? This is gonna go somewhere. In Miami, I realized that I didn't wanna just continue doing warehouse parties. I kind of reached the ceiling. So I wanted to go to the next step and do a festival. We started coming up with ideas of what we can do that would be special, something unique, something different. Let's go cut to the main stage area and we'll go up to uh, Carl Stadium. First year of Ultra Music Festival on the beach, started with 10,000 people, and then it just grew from there. The attendance just kept rising and rising and rising. One year, it really exploded and went up over 100,000. The scene just kept growing and growing. I knew that we were onto something. I knew it eventually would filter around to the rest of the country. I think the guy that got us to where we are today was actually David Guetta. They would get a collaboration with uh, the Black Eyed Peas. That record really opened the door. People were interviewing me about me bringing electronic culture to the U.S. and I'm like, what? It's coming from the U.S. A lot of people, even in America, didn't know this. David Guetta was making music that was acceptable to Top 40 Radio and it actually really catching fire. He's been by far the reason that EDM has had such an amazing cultural success. That song introduced so many people to another form of music, they started looking in. We're now in a global scene. We're in a billion dollar industry. We hear electronic music everywhere. It has become pop music. So those crowds, the people who, who do listen to pop music are now listening to electronic music. All of us are reaping the benefits of that. When you go to one of these events, you escape from whatever you're involved in in life. Because a lot of electronic music is instrumental, it's universal. There's no language attached to it. Everybody can understand it. Music is the language itself. You can't really do dance music on your own. It's participatory. It's a tribal experience you have together, right? It's, it's meant to be enjoyed in a group. It 
It's crazy how many festivals around the world there are. Those electronic festivals came from raves. What we started, from where it was to where it is now today, we've made it as a, as a, as a whole for the scene. These artists right now are averaging a half a million dollar a night. Now there's like a commercial appeal to them. You can hear, like, that's the only thing you hear on pop radio now is EDM music. Every urban artist, pop star, anybody who's anybody wants a dance record on their album. Are you happy with a structure like this? How about this? How about this? How about this? First break is just do it, do it, and then the second break is both of them together. It's so like if what I think if we have this the first break is that when the drop comes with the melody, it's it's way too random, it's out of nothing. The, the reason I initially wanted to work with Martin is because of animals. I heard it and I was like, this is fucking weird. I I like it. It's 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 different. We're gonna record like right now the guitar parts. Do you want it like that? Oh. Yeah, that's better. You know what, I'll do it and then you can chop it and use it. Yeah, just uh, just turn the track down low, if that's all right. You forget how young Martin is, because he's so, like, world-traveled. Like, if, if, if you feel like he's like, he's like Tiesto or something. The quality of production is really yeah. out there, everywhere. Yeah. So many good producers, you know? Yeah. What's the problem for me, it's there's a lot of, Empty music. How are we gonna make music that touch people's heart, but in a new, so fresh, and exciting yeah. way? I really feel like a creative musical chemist. You know what I mean? When the fusion of music comes together, whatever you may call it, pop, R&B, and EDM, and it works, and it opened an entire new conversation. It's those greats before us who created that fusion. Like Michael Jackson, when disco was on its way out and rock was on its way in, Michael was able to create something that satisfied both parties. like once the world was able to hear uh, EDM in that way and me experiment with David Guetta and now Martin Garrix, to me that creates an entire new movement. It's created a, an authenticity within a style that everybody's kind of enjoying. What the big challenge is for me is to keep evolve, evolving and to stay relevant. Imagine 
that you're standing there and you're seeing your son and he's standing before 40,000 people. It's incredible. Martin Garrix, he put him on a festival and he can't do no wrong. So it's something which is wondrous, you know, you know, you've got someone that's this 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 young who's connecting with 18 year olds, he's connecting directly to the people he is inspiring. It'd be difficult for me to be there and have 18 year olds going, oh my God, he's amazing. They'd be like, oh my God, my dad's amazing. You know, it doesn't work. I don't see myself as a, as a big act. It doesn't count how many tickets you sell. It also counts about what you did for the industry, what you are still doing, and what, what your abilities are, what you can do. Hey, there he is. How you doing? Hey. <laughs> So you played already, right? I, I it? just came off stage and we rushed just here. Came we off, just really? rushed here. To, oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> no worries, it's all good. <laughs> I, res I respect Carl as a producer and a DJ. How was his DJ sets are, I can't play eight hours in a row and not lose the attention from the crowd. The longest set I've done is 12, uh, 10 hours. Straight. How did you do it? Like, yeah. you didn't play one track two times? No, no. That's <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you do it solo or did you do it back to back with others? No, no, no. Just me on my own. Yeah. <laughs> Went to the toilet I, once, yeah, yeah. Uh, two, two slices of pizza, and uh, I think four beers, and that was me. <laughs> but that's something I respect. Yeah. I can't think about 12 hours. That's it, nuts. It, it, he can do so many things which I am dreaming of and which I'm still trying to do. I, I mean, I was actually quite shy as a, as a young DJ when I was up on the stage. I had the curtains closed and I was still playing my music. And I was like, keep them closed, keep them closed as long as I could. And then when I go to the DJ, I'll be like, <laughs> well, that's cool though. I'll be playing, you know, and then um, say something on the mic, I'll be like, no. <laughs> you say something, you know. But that's how it was for me. I kind of grew into all of this, you know. Yeah. We Martin's got to believe that he can do this because the, 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 the whole scene rests on his shoulders now. He's young, he's, he's hungry, and, he, and he's, he's out to basically set the bar on what happens next. We all lost souls at one point, and when we come together at dance music festivals, we're not lost anymore. Dance music used to be my little secret, you know, it was my little thing. But if you have something great, you want to share it with as many people as possible. This is a love thing, and it's a fun thing, and you should never never be greedy about something great. It's not about being on the top, it's about making other people happy. It's all about the DJ, the music, the people you're surrounded with. I think that's so beautiful. You make people happy and make them forget about everything else. I'm kind of happy that it's going towards a new direction right now. 
because that won't make it like fade away and that's the only fear I have like because it went like same with same with my career like because it went so fast I just hope like I can hold on what I just hope is that electronic music is not at the limit yet and it can still grow for the next 10 years I just hope I can be like a part of it and we'll see what happens. We love and are tied together by music created by a technology that is always evolving and mutating. That makes every day a new possibility. God, what we started to where we are now, years later, it, it, it was some achievement. Whether it's underground or more commercial, as a whole, electronic music is thriving around the world. I want to protect the scene, you know, I want it to be here a long time. Way after I'm done and retired and in the ground, in rave heaven, uh, I want this to go on forever.